Um, well, I actually thought we were missing three. Isn't she like not there anymore? Like, is she homeschool? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. All right, so welcome back. We didn't have class on Tuesday, obviously, because of the assembly. And so we're a little bit behind the other class. And I don't really know the status oh, of each of the missing people, but I thought we were going to be missing three, but we are blessed with less. Uh, even still, just so that those who are out don't fall behind, I will take this class. Um, let me kind of lay out where we are, where we left off. This is our first session since Christmas break. So um, I just gave everybody a supplemental handout. We're done with the unit on abnormal behavior and we had a test, we had a test on everything we did in unit one before the break. Then we watched a movie before the break. And now what we're gonna do is add this uh, the, the topic of defense mechanisms, defense mechanisms. This fits pretty well with unit one, with abnormal behavior. And we'll, we'll basically consider this like attack of right? Additional content. So I'll take today. Um, I'm out Tuesday of next week. I've got to move my daughter into a Brox apartment for her student teaching experience. But Thursday of next week, and then probably Monday of the following week, the last week of the second marking period, we'll put the finishing touches on the supplement, and then we're gonna have, one more time, one last time, the unit one abnormal behavior final test. The vast majority of the questions on that test you will have seen already, or some variation of them. You guys, I think by now know how this routine works. Like we got about a third of the way through the unit, boom, test. Two thirds of the way through the unit, second test, but a lot of the questions you'd already seen or at least something similar to them. And then when we wrapped it up, there it is, the whole unit and about two thirds of the content on that particular test was, was stuff that you'd seen before and should have been familiar with. So this is just a fourth version of it that will include this topic of defense mechanisms. So Talk to me. I, yeah. So um, how many like, units do we have with you? So in the site class, there are four units. And because we meet every other day, it feels like, oh my gosh, we're just wrapping up unit one. But um, you, have to, you have to basically take two marking periods, cut it in half. It would, take, it would have taken us the equivalent of one marking period to finish abnormal behavior, and that's going to be soon. We get into the third marking period. We do unit two, which is on cognition, thinking, learning, remembering. That's probably going to take us all of the third marking period. Then you get into the home stretch, the fourth marking period. There's a unit on developmental psychology, about five weeks. There's a unit on uh, mind-body interaction, around five weeks. Boom, done. Wait, there's five, ten weeks in the fourth quarter? Uh, yep, in every quarter, supposedly. Okay, but I think I told you guys at the beginning of the year, this first unit on abnormal behavior takes the longest time, and it obviously has. Okay, so. Um, if, if you remember the test before the break, remember how I told you to skip the section on, there was like a matching section I said to cross out and leave a gap on the Scantron? That's this. That's this. So after we finish this packet of roughly 15 defense mechanisms, you'll take that test again, but the section on defense mechanisms is fair game this time. Get it? All right. So, what are defense mechanisms? <clears throat> Remember at the beginning of the year when I was talking about the woman on the subway who I'm pretty sure was schizophrenic? Look, she didn't just wake up one day and, and snap and start having delusions and hallucinations. She, she, was, she was probably predisposed genetically through maybe a serotonin imbalance or a dopamine imbalance to eventually develop some type of you know, maybe mild schizophrenia. But it's entirely possible, likely, that something stressful put her over the edge. And, you know, I, I hate to think that she's too far gone. Maybe, hopefully not. Schizophrenia is, you know, treatable, controllable, but not curable. Um, but without treatment, it's going to get worse and worse. Like, like John Nash, right? Like the movie we watched? Okay. So, I don't know what happened. How did, how did she go so far off the deep end? How did she get so far gone? 
can't. I, I don't know her life. I don't know her backstory. I don't know. I don't know her life history. But probably something stressful, something traumatic, some some life event, some epic setback that just put her over the edge. Okay. Did you ever experience stress? Of course. Did you ever experience anxiety? Of course. So so have I. Um, if you ever I'm almost afraid to ask this. Experience like fits of anger bordering on rage? Sure. Sure. We're human. We have those human failings. Psychologically speaking, you know, we're, we're predisposed to those types of emotions and attempting to process them, cope with them, make sense. All right. Here's where I'm going with this. Whatever it was that put that woman over the edge is like a type of energy. Stress is like energy. And I don't know, I'm not a science teacher, maybe you guys have taken physics or chemistry, but like one of the first rules of, I think it's thermodynamics, is energy can neither be created nor destroyed, right? So if something traumatic happens to me, if something embarrassing or painful or grief-inducing happens to me, that's energy. Like over the break, my, my mother died on Christmas morning. All right, that's painful, that hurts, that's something that makes a person sad, right? Okay, um, I think I've processed it, I'm pretty sure I'm, I've coped with it, um, I've grieved, I don't, have you ever experienced a death in the family? I'm, I'm sure you have, any type of tragedy? All right, and people will deal with it in different ways, fine. But the key is dealing with it. So, so what if you can't? You basically have three choices when we talk about psychology. You can cope, right? You can process stuff and deal with it and get past it. You can be totally overwhelmed by it and maybe have like a nervous breakdown. That's not a good option. But these represent sort of a third choice. Sometimes we're not ready to cope with something or process it but we don't want to go so far off the deep end that we end up maybe like that woman on the subway. Well, not everyone's predisposed to schizophrenia, but you get my point, right? So instead, we deflect. We come up with like a temporary short-term solution. And psych they're not solutions, but psychology calls these defense mechanisms. It's not something that's gonna be helpful or productive to or for you long-term. These aren't coping mechanisms, these are defense mechanisms. It's a short-term, temporary, I don't want to deal with this, but I also don't want to go off the deep end and have a nervous breakdown. I don't want to deal with this, but I'm not in a position to cope yet. So you know what? I'm just gonna deny it, or I'm gonna repress it, or I'm gonna displace it, or I'm gonna project it, or I'm gonna overcompensate because of it. There's 15 of them, I just laid out five. And we'll get through like four or five today. So, so the, the, the main thing I want to say at the outset is everything listed here, this isn't healthy. This isn't productive. This isn't something psychologically that you want to resort to. It's what we call defense mechanisms. Oh, here comes the energy. Here comes the stress. Here comes the embarrassment. Here comes the situation that's making me angry. Here, here comes like the traumatic experience, how do I just temporarily kind of deflect it? Not cope, but deflect it, get it? I think the best way to understand these is to just dive in with definitions and then examples. The sheet I gave you pretty much lays out all the definitions and you know, take notes, don't take notes, it's up to you, but I, I would like in the margin jot down examples and feel free to interject some of your own examples because you might have some that occur to you while we're doing this, okay? The most common defense mechanism, according to psychology, is repression, repression. And repression occurs, re repression is motivated forgetting. Repression is where you forget something because it's just too what? Too what? It's too painful. It's too traumatic. Look, 
But let's go back to my personal example of repression. I think I shared this with you. The horrific show and tell incident, circa 1969. Oh. Kindergarten, right? I told you guys about that, right? Chad, come in there. So yeah, so you've heard the story. It was a Sunday night, I was five years old, I was in kindergarten, and I was watching Wonderful World of Disney. And I went to the bathroom and I was in a hurry because I didn't want to miss the show. You didn't have DVR back then. And so I had to pee and I put the seat up. I'm actually taping this class wonderful. And um, let's just say that there was an incident and the seat oh. came down and I got injured. Okay, right? Remember that like it was yesterday. Mother was freaking out. <laughs> Called my dad to do something. It hurt. It was painful. Yep. Remember that vividly. What don't I remember? Next day, Monday morning. I basically brandished it for everyone to see in kindergarten. <laughs> yep, show and tell. I got hurt last night watching TV and like, boom. <laughs> there you go, everybody. <laughs> right? As God is my witness, I don't remember the show and tell thing. Now, you did do it? You really trust did. me, my parents, I always, like all throughout like elementary and high school, people would say, remember that time in kindergarten? I'd say, I don't remember this, oh. knock it off, you know? <laughs> And I would ask my parents, and they, oh yeah, that happened. Like they got a call about it and everything. So look, I don't know. I was five years old. It's probably a memory issue, but sometimes we forget things because we want to forget them. Sometimes we, what's the word? Repress. Repress them. Motivated forgetting. You know, on a less comical note, people who are sexually or physically abused sometimes have no recollection of the incident. It might come out later in dreams or like psychoanalysis. We're going to watch a video on memory when we get to unit two where this guy who was molested at a summer camp remembers it like 20 years later because of a dream, confronts his molester, gets him to admit it, and like, wow, for two decades he had no recollection of it. Like that's the power of the mind. That's kind of the confusing mystique of psychology. Um, you know, that's... That's a form of repression. Thoughts, questions, examples? How does that happen? Like, how does something so traumatic happen that your brain just like shuts out? What's What's the topic here? What are we calling these? Defense, defense mechanisms. Um, it's 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 almost a built-in defense mechanism to protect yourself from being just overwhelmed. So, so. There's, there's something called suppression, and that's where like, oh, I've got to go on a conference with Ms. Lefevre. I don't like her, she doesn't like me, but they, tell, they say we have to go together. All right, I'm going to try to be nice to her. I'm going to suppress my hostility towards her. I'm just making this up, it's not true. But that's something I'm consciously doing that I know about. I can't explain to you the psychological dynamic of repression, I just know that on some subconscious level, as, as a defense mechanism, so you're not overwhelmed by grief, guilt, whatever, it seeps into your subconscious. It goes into your, the deep recesses of your mind. And, and it's like, well, right, and you, you'd almost prefer it stay there, right? Because you don't want to confront like it. Like at the same time, like I want to know if that would happen, like I want to remember it, but at the same time I want to do it. Right, okay, and that's the key point. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have to go through the coping procedure with this. That's, so, I'm the same way. We're all the same way. Um, it's hard sometimes to process that stuff. This doesn't help you do it, but it's a temporary measure. Get it? Okay. So, I, I'm trying to think of other examples of repression where people forget because remembering is too painful. Have you ever had, like, you, you've taught longer than I have. Have you ever had a student show up on test day and you'd been, you'd been announcing that test for days in advance? And I, I've had this happen. Look, you can say a lot of, you can criticize some of my teaching strategies, but as far as giving you guys a heads up on what's coming, I don't think that's something I'm lax in. Like I always let you know well ahead of time when tests are. Fair? Okay. So. It, say this was college, and it was a really difficult course that you were struggling with, and that caused you stress or trauma. And even though you were trying, you were struggling. All right, 
Hey, it's Monday, we have a test Friday. Hey, it's Tuesday, remember we have a test on Friday. Hey, it's Wednesday, test is, you know, three days away. Hey, it's Thursday, we have a test tomorrow. Everybody got that? Yep, give me some affirmation, got it? You show up Friday, we have a test today? I wonder, because I've had this happen, have you? I've had this happen with students like in the college course. Oh, with students. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, yeah. I wonder if on some level, people forget about the test because they don't trust their ability to pass it. And it's such a source of stress for them that, boom, there it goes yeah. into the subconscious. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, in terms of school procedure, but in within the within the realm of psychoanalysis and psychological treatment, it could have merit. That could be a real thing. That's all I'm saying. People forget things because sometimes they want to forget things. Oh, yeah. So another word for repression is motivated forgetting. The most common defense mechanism. Okay, next up, number two. Denial, which is the most primitive defense mechanism. Also quite common. What is denial? You know what they say about denial? It's not just, say it. Say it. It's not just a river in Egypt. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Oh, that's a Butler joke. Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to repress that. I don't know. All right. So, um, denial. Not denial, but denial. Guess what? I've done this. You've done this. We all do this. Here comes something painful. Here comes something traumatic. Here, here comes something. Right. No, not me. I mean, total denial. Definition. You refuse to acknowledge a painful reality. It just, nope, didn't happen. You're, you're almost reverting to like childlike impulses. Um, you, you just will not accept reality. If, if I ignore it, it didn't happen. Okay, so, examples. Um, let's say, this is not the case, but let's say hypothetically that my wife and I, we've been married for 25 years, you know, we're, we're splitting. We're divorcing. Not true. Not the case, as far as I know. Um, and and you know, word of that gets out, and people say to me like, "Oh, I, I hear you guys split." Yeah, you know. Just we, a rumor. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This, this. We've been having problems, and we just sort of agreed that it was time to part ways. When in reality, she dumped me. She kicked me out. She rejected me. You know what? That hurts. Doesn't that hurt? That's painful. Yeah, but it's not some sort of lying. Talk to me. Yeah, yes. It's self-deception. You're deceiving yourself. I know what really happened. My wife decided she didn't want to be with me anymore. Again, camera land, this isn't real. But it, it makes it easier for me. I'm not coping, but I'm not snapping. I'm deflecting. Get it? I'm defense mechanisming. I'm saying, well, we agreed to a trial separation. It's a lie. I'm lying to myself. I'm lying to you. But it's my way of just, nope, nope, don't want to acknowledge the painful reality. If, this is kind of a sad example, but, but sometimes when, um, like, parents lose a child, tragically, like, they have a kid die, They'll, they'll leave their room the way it always was. Have you ever heard of this? Oh, yeah. They'll set a place for them at the table, stuff like that. I would never say to somebody going through that process, like, okay, this is not healthy. I get it. I get why people do it. But do you see how that's not a coping mechanism? Yeah, it's a, right. It, long term, it's not going to help you. It's a defense mechanism. It's a temporary sort of band-aid. So, so that's, that's the definition of, and I think a pretty good example of, Denial. Yes. Um, I've got a video, a short video on this. I want to show you. Go ahead. My aunt, she, I can't remember what disease she has, but like she's just slower than other people. And okay. So my, 
So maybe like a cognitive disability, yeah, a learning disability. Sure. Has to like take care of her and stuff mm -hmm. like that. She has like numerous nurses to help her. Mm -hmm. And like. This her, isn't Carrie. No. Okay, I was gonna say Carrie's pretty sharp. No, right, Sherry is. That's all right. Yeah, don't Sherry's say that. Sherry's sister. Don't say that because it's not Carrie. Um, yeah, go ahead. But like my great grandparents, which are her parents, mm -hmm. she still always talks about them and like. Every time I see her, she always tells me, she's like, my dad got sick and died. But then and after that, she always talks about his car and his jukeboxes and stuff so like that. Is that, would that count as like a defense mechanism? So, okay, so on some level, you think that there's stress or trauma grieving over a loss, yeah, but she she's... Always, she always brings it up, like anytime anybody sees okay. her, like she always just... So I don't know all the details of this, and for like the hundredth time, I'm not a psychologist, yeah. but it sounds like she's trying to deflect the stress towards like possessions and specific details. That is a defense mechanism that's on our list. It's called intellectualization, where you, where you basically avoid grieving by looking at something as a distraction. Like, like at my mother's funeral, one, I've got two sisters, and one of them you could tell was really stressed out about it. And to, to sort of, I guess, deflect or defend, she kept saying, oh, who sent these flowers? Oh, remember this picture? She was just trying to create a diversion. That yeah. sounds a little bit like what you're describing. Yeah, because she always like brings it up, but then she'll be like, but his jukebox is up at home. Right. While his old house right. is next to my grandma's house, but her niece lives there now, okay. which is my cousin. So, so it's not all... really her house anymore, but she always is like, but his jukebox is still up at home, even though it's not at home. So I don't, again, yeah, I don't know all the details yeah, of this like, beyond what you're telling me, but it also sounds a little bit like trying to keep the memory alive somewhat, which is understandable. Okay, so with denial in mind, let's watch an old episode of American Idol. What is your name? My name is Vernika Patterson. Vernika, what's up? What are you going to say? Um, me you represent Loving You. Okay. Yeah. Loving You, it's easy comes, you're beautiful. Mm. Sorry, can I start it off? Hey. I'm nervous. The lady no. looking at me. Oh, I don't know. 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 She's like a lady. Yeah, okay. That's me. How about if we all just kind of look away? Here, here, here we go. <laughs> what should we do? Tell us. It's your own decision. You're the judge. Okay, I'll start over. Okay. Loving you is more than just a dream come true. And everything that I do is out of loving you. Can you please stop? 
filming and they just keep filming. It's kind of a competition. Well, they do, they do a montage here of other people who don't want to be filmed. But Vernika wasn't the only one on day two not having happy days. Hey, America, I like to kiss my <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so look, right, look, that's a hard song to say, <laughs> but come on, like she wasn't getting through to uh, Hollywood or whatever, and so she, she demonstrates two defense mechanisms, you know, she thought she was good, come on, you think she was good? No, no. I mean, she wasn't terrible, but she wasn't good, so she's in, tonight, and then when she goes with the, is it because I'm not skinny, like it? Now she's moving into what we're going to call rationalization, making excuses. But anyway, let's let's move on to the next one. Then let, let me see if I can knock out two more before the bell. So, any questions on denial? Mm -hmm. Displacement and projection are similar, not identical, but similar. With displacement, here comes the stress, here comes the anxiety, here comes the embarrassment. Here comes the anger. Here comes the trauma. I'm going to send it somewhere else. I'm going to make somebody else the target of my emotions. Okay, so yesterday, or two days ago, we had the assembly on bullying. Perfectly timed question. Riley, well done. So, some bullies, I think, act that way because they were probably bullied themselves. Or maybe or maybe even are by somebody older, whatever, stronger, more intimidating. Look, some bullies are just grade A a-holes. They're sociopaths, they're jerks. But I suspect that some, it is what we call displacement. Mm -hmm. They're taking out what's been directed at them on somebody else who's less intimidating. Like, if you're being bullied, a lot of people feel like they can't lash out at their bully because they're bigger, stronger, whatever. So they try to find somebody less intimidating. Okay, well, there are a lot of examples of that. If, if, if I work like in some private sector job and my boss chews me out, then that makes me angry. On some level, I, I might be like, oh, you know, how dare he say that to me? But I can't afford to lash out at him. He's my boss, I might lose my job. Might lose my job. So I go home and what do I do? Take it out of my wife, yell at my kids, kick the dog, whatever. That's displacement. I just, you know, brainstorming here. But that's displacement. Have you ever made some innocent bystander the target of anger that you should have directed towards someone else? Yes. Of course you have. So have I. So have I. It's human nature. It's displacement. It's displacement. And we tend to think of it in terms of anger. And that's legit, because that's probably the most common example. But let me give you another example of displacement. Ready? Well, definition, definition. Displacement is where you take out your impulse on a less threatening target. You use someone else, or something else, sometimes it's an inanimate object, uh, as a target for your emotions and motives. So the rage example, the anger example, I think is easily understood. But let me take you back to my freshman year in college. Uh, fall of 1982, the University of Buffalo. I lived in the dorms for one year. Ninth floor, Goodyear Hall. And a lot of times when people give examples like this, this and they say it was my friend, they're really talking about themselves. This was not me. I would own this if this was me, but it was not me. So I... I had a roommate my first year, his name was Howie Eisenberg from Nanuet. I still keep in touch with him, we talk sometimes. And he and I shared a suite with two other guys. So we had, the way the dorm was set up, it was a co-ed floor. I don't know if they do that as much anymore, maybe. 
but this was weird. This was like pure debauchery. So it's my freshman year in college, and I'm in the dorms, and it goes, me and Howie in one room, a bathroom sharing with Barry and Ben in the other. But then the next Barry, next, and, ben. Barry and Ben. And so the two. Barry, Ben, and Howie. There it is. So, so that was a guy suite. The next room down was two girls who shared a bathroom with two other girls. Like, that's how our dorm was laid out. And you're talking, what, 18, 19 raging hormones. So Barry, who was my sweet mate, that sounds weird, but you know what I mean, <laughs> was absolutely infatuated with a girl who lived next door. And she was, how do I say this diplomatically, she was stunning. She was stunningly beautiful. Barry's a good looking guy. Barry's a lawyer today. Um, you know, Barry was, he, he was not without his charms. And he was completely fixated on this girl. And I think on some level, he felt like she was unattainable. Out of his lead, right? Okay. Guess who Barry dated? Her. Nope. His friend, her friend. Her roommate. Ooh. Is that weird? Well, okay, Go ahead. Is that bizarre? Um, so isn't it like true that like sometimes like guys date like a sister or a friend to get closer to the other girl? This place? I don't know if his. I don't know if his. It sounds creepy. I don't know if his end game was to get to her or just be closer to her. But we all look. Look, I I took psychology as a freshman in college, and I I think I thought this was almost like an experiment. Like, dude, do you know what you're doing? Why don't you? Why didn't you ask the girl you were interested in out? Well, I. But okay, fine. You don't feel like she's a table. Do you think it's really fair to a roommate? Because clearly there's some bizarre psychology going on here. Talk to me. Is um. Is that maybe what his roommate? Maybe he was like, I can't get this girl. I'll get it next. So I'll get. Yeah, I'll get the one that's maybe not. Okay, so say you're going to go to the store, you have like $200. You're going to get an iPhone X. You can't do that at $200. Right. Yeah. So settling. So you settle for a sure. cheaper phone. Sure. Look, I think that's a fair question. I think that's a good question. And for like the hundredth time, I'm not a psychologist. But why her, right? Why her? And no, there, it's, I'm not saying that the roommate was like some ghastly, hideous, no one would go near. I'm just. It was so obvious what he was doing. I, I think this just screams displacement. Not anger displacement, what kind of displacement? Denied. No, what kind of displacement? Um, what emotion, not anger. Kind of anxiety? Nope. Moment. Sadness. Yeah. Uh, Depression? Depression. Depression. What? Multiplication. Okay, now you say sexual. <gasps> let's just go, no, maybe, but let's just go with affection. Right? Affection. Sure. Affection. Some science, you know. Okay. Do you grasp the concept? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> last thing for today. Projection. Now, this is confusing because it sounds a little like displacement. With displacement, you become the target of my emotion. I'm mad at her, but I lash out at him. That's displacement. I do that with my Of course, we all do. Like my mom will yell at me. With, hold up, with projection, I make you, not the target, but the source, the cause. You're why I'm experiencing this. So let's say, okay, some examples. Let's say Joey and I decide to open a restaurant together. That's a risk, especially in this area, right? And restaurants, you know, a lot of them fail. But we're both into this. What do you think, Joe? Do we do this? Boy, it's a risk. You in? I'm in. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. All right, here we go. And then we try it. And we're open for about six months. And then it goes completely. And it totally crashes. <laughs> and if you take economics with me, <laughs> you know that when you owe money to creditors, shh, listen, and you have a failed business, there's no limit to how much you can lose. They can come after your home, your unless you're a corporation. If you're a proprietorship and a partnership, they can come after you. So, so that's stressful to me. I'm losing my home. I'm losing my bank. And yes, yes, exactly. 
Why did I let you talk me into this? This was all your stupid idea. I'm making him the source of my emotion. No, it was my idea too. But that hurts, that's painful, that's stressful. It's just kind of like playing a, like a video game and having your annoying siblings sitting there talking next to you and you die and you're like, it's all your fault. Uh, well, to the extent that they distracted you, it might be. But, but sort of. That, yeah. Or they were just sitting there. You're looking for excuses. So, like, say... Talk to me, Lex. <laughs> say you sneak into, like, a school or something and, like, just, like, mess around and everything. <laughs> Oh, that's Should I turn off the camera? <laughs> 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 Should I turn off the camera? <laughs> they already got trouble before us. Keep familiar. going. But say you get caught, <laughs> you blame like the other judge. <laughs> You blame the other person and everything. Yeah. You're like, oh, it's all his fault. I know. Oh, it went with all of him. Oh, and then like you stop hanging out with them, everything. You just cut them out of your life yeah. and everything. Would that be? Look, possibly. I, I know what you're talking about, and I know who you're talking about, and we all do. But I don't know. I don't know the dynamics of the relationship. So it, it sounds a little bit like what I'm hypothetically drawing up with me and Joey in the restaurant, right? Earlier, I used a hypothetical example of like my wife dumping me, but I'm in denial. I say it was a mutual parting of the ways. Well, let me pursue that. Let's say, again, totally hypothetical, not true. Let's say that I'm being unfaithful. I'm cheating on my wife. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Well, let's say I am. You know what? On some level, well, on some level, I'm a creep, right? But on, but on another level, I feel guilty. I feel conflicted. Okay, so stop. Eh, don't want to. Again, hypothetical. Now, that causes me stress you turn on her, you make me. okay what are you in my head today or something are you living in my brain rent free kid because you're always one step ahead of me so i'm cheating you're, you're my wife i'm cheating i'm cheating on you and that causes me stress so i say to you you make me do it no you're not good enough. no worse why are you cheating on me i know you're cheating on me why are you're you cheating being on like, me so i cheated on you so you, that. so you see what i'm doing I'm not displacing. I'm what? It's like reverse psychology. I'm what? I'm projecting. Here we are learning reverse psychology. I'm projecting. Okay, we'll leave it there. Dang, oh. I'm smart. Well, you, you were on your game today. That was good. Reverse psychology. Psychology. I'm sorry, but I had. I had.